it on. Check one, two. There we go. All right, join me in prayer for the kids. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for these, these children, these youth, and for the parents that have decided that your ways are important to study. Lord, would you cause their minds to be curious and their teachers to be wise. Amen. All right, off with you and be lively. This morning, we are going to continue our study of James. Uh, last week, the speaker, who I have to call Pat because these go on the internet, spoke on verses four, or chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. Uh, and it was kind of a tough walk. Um, those were some hard verses to read, some hard verses to sort of take into yourself. But we ended on a positive note. Uh, we ended on a hopeful note. And today, we get, uh, we get kind of our payoff for all that work. Uh, James 4:10 through 11 says, "Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks evil against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge." So we're going to kind of break those into two parts uh, this morning. First, speaking about humility. If, uh, if any of you watch Wednesday night services on our YouTube channel, you know that it seems whenever I talk, it always seems to come back to humility. And it has, it has started to, it has started to uh, affect me, <laughs> that it always seems to, to turn up whenever it's my turn. So humble, the Lord, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Isn't that everybody's favorite type of Bible verse? It's, it's so simple, it's quotable. And it's something that, like, right off the bat, it's not difficult to believe. It feels right. You know, there's no semicolon at the end, so you can memorize it without having to worry about what comes after or before. You know, sometimes you find a cool verse that, you know, I, I wish I could just remember this part, but, you know, the next part kind of makes it more difficult. Um, if, uh, if it sounds like something out of Proverbs, you've got good instincts. Maybe you've been listening to Brian's advice and reading your proverb a day. Uh, this idea actually shows up at least three times in Proverbs, this idea of humbling yourself and then being exalted. Uh, it seems to come up over and over again. Paul brings it up three times um, uh, in, the, uh, in sort of the context of service, uh, which requires humility. Anyone who's ever had to serve anybody uh, understands that you, really, you, you, can't, you certainly can't do it well, uh, high and lifted up. So, a simple verse, but like many of the best simple things, not easy. Um, humbling ourselves, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a, there, there are levels to it. There are different, uh, you know, different levels to sort of humbling ourselves. Um, if, we, if we do something generous, or if we do something particularly clever, and somebody thanks or praises us, uh, she's to shake her heads and say, uh, oh, it's it's nothing more than anybody would have done or, you know, oh, don't know, it's, it's all fine. While we, like, soak up the praise inside, right? Or if we're, if we're sick or we're injured, it's easy to sort of apply the, the face of woe and be like, God is testing me. <laughs> and, uh, and we, we, you know, we can sort of get dramatic and sort of soak in that pity. Um, but is that really humility? Um, I just, just crossed six months of, uh, of marriage yesterday, and it has brought sort of these new frontiers, right? Uh, and I thought, you know, I thought it was going to be easier to be humble and to be humbled around my wife, because I figured, you know, she already, she already knows me pretty well, right? She, there's, there shouldn't really be anything that surprises her, right? Uh, but no, that hasn't, that hasn't been how it's been. It's, it's, far more difficult to humble myself, and it's far more painful to be humbled uh, in front of my wife. Why is that? Now, probably a bunch of reasons that I should probably think through privately, but uh, the first reason is her opinion of me matters way more than, well, really anybody's. Uh, and second of all, she can tell when I'm faking it. Fake humility is not going to fly. And how much more before God? We had some, you know, we've already, we've already sung and we've prayed talking about humility this morning uh, and, and, you know, what a challenge it can be. Our most accessible example of this type of humility uh, is found in Luke 18, 9 through 12. 
This is uh, Jesus speaking. He also told his parable, uh, this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give tithes of all I get. This Pharisee wasn't, wasn't really there to talk to God, was he? It certainly doesn't seem like it. He wasn't praying anything edifying. He wasn't leading in prayer. Uh, I don't think he was really concerned with the soul of this tax collector. Um, if he did, maybe he would have kept that prayer between him and God. Or maybe he would have gone to the tax collector and asked him, hey, would you like some prayer? But no, he was confident. He knew who he was dealing with. Now, tax collectors are tricky business. Um, it's pretty common throughout history that uh, governments would deal with taxation through contractors. If you don't have the infrastructure for taxation, or you don't really want to think too hard about it, what they would do, and this happened all throughout the earth and throughout history, is the government would sell the taxation rights to someone. Uh, and then that, so they would get a big chunk of money, and then they wouldn't have to deal with taxes. And then whoever bought the taxation rights, well, they would go hire some goons uh, with big sticks, and they would go get their money back. And at this time in the world, uh, at this time and place, Rome was using willing Jews who would go and tax their own people. And as it goes, because they weren't, once they paid their money you know, to the government, they really weren't overseen, so they would take more than their fair share. So tax collectors were not only considered thieves, but traitors to their people. Uh, this trial was done in the court of public opinion, and all tax collectors were guilty as a matter of course. So this brings us to the main thrust of this, uh, this passage. The Pharisee lists several actual sins, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and then even this tax collector. Now, the Pharisee considered this man's existence to be a sin. Now the interesting thing is we know the tax collector thought the same way. Um, but it turns out his attitude was the important part. The Pharisee didn't know this tax collector's heart. Not even the tax collector really knew it. Uh, one of my favorite corners of the internet is the lawyer corner of the internet where you know, lawyers will talk about amicus briefs or they'll talk about weird trials uh, or you know, unusual things going on in the world. And it's, it's interesting to look at how you know, this system we have can sort of take a knot of madness and with case law and with procedure, it sort of spools it out like a, you know, just renders it down like a garlic clove in a, in a food processor. Um, it's, it's really interesting to me. And maybe I just like hearing people use words like pursuant. Um, but either way, I find it sort of interesting now to, to try to think about these things like a judge or like a lawyer. So let's think about this uh, from the perspective of our modern grasp of jurisprudence. What, was this, what has this Pharisee done wrong? Well, he goes to the temple and prays to pray publicly, verbally dunks on this tax collector. We can assume that they have not met because the Pharisee doesn't say, I thank you that I am not as Dave here, corrupt agent of the oppressive foreign revenue. He refers to him as this tax collector. He doesn't even know his name. If he doesn't know his name, how much could he know about him firsthand? Now, he could have said, uh, abusing your authority to overtax people is wrong. And that would have been fine and that would have been true, but that wouldn't have won him any points with it, praying in public. Everyone already knows this. The, the point of this whole exercise was to elevate himself over this, over this tax collector. So not only does our Pharisee not have enough evidence to convict, he doesn't appear to have what my YouTube lawyers would call a cause of action. He doesn't really have a, 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 enough evidence to call the police on this guy. He doesn't have enough evidence to, you know, or a reason to raise a suit. So we can think of... Uh, any number of ways our speech can be evil. That's what we're getting to, evil speech. Uh, words that incite hatred or violence, lies or deception. Uh, maybe those deserve their own study. But in this passage, this, this idea of evil speech is translated as making slander or false accusations. And it seems in this verse that that sort of speech kind of just flows from that pride. So what does the tax collector say? In verse 4, the tax collector standing afar off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exhausted. Exalted. Now, like we said last week, there is a difference between earthly and godly sorrow. The Pharisee thought for sure this guy was guilty. The tax collector knew he was guilty, and he was broken by it. This is the real deal, uh, and it drove the tax collector. He could have stayed home and sort of stewed in his guilt uh, and the knowledge of his own wretchedness, but he didn't. He didn't hide his shame from God. He brought himself to the judge, the only one who could justify him. Now, if anyone's been in a courtroom, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I have found myself uh, at the pointy end of our justice system, and I can tell you that if you go before an earthly judge with anything less than absolute humility, you are in for a long, long day. (laughs) Earthly judges have an incredible amount of freedom. They're the closest thing to a king that we have in this country. Uh, If you try to talk out of turn, if you try to go where you shouldn't go, there is an area around where the judge sits. And if you go there without permission, he has a guy that will tackle you. Uh, you You have to be very circumspect when you go before a judge. And I, I know that, you know, maybe, it's, maybe it shouldn't be that the way you talk and the way you dress, you know, you should be able to get justice either way. But there's a reason that when we go before judges, we walk small and we wear our best. Uh, and how much more when we go before God, the only judge that can really justify us. While we're thinking like judges, let's look at the next segment of our key verse. Uh, the one who, uh, this is verse 11. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. What does that mean? What does it mean? Is that, does this mean that our brother is the law? To me, it's, it like, sounds like a line out of a Western. I'm the law around these parts. And I think anyone with a brother or with a sibling could, could maybe feel a little unnerved about that. What if our brothers or our sisters are the law? Um, that's, that's troubling some, in some ways. Uh, but yeah, in a way, yes. Uh, this is the new covenant that Jeremiah prophesied. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33 said, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, by my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. This was the plan all along. We were to take the law into us, to make it a part of us. In another one of Paul's letters, it seems like this process is proceeding. It's going well. Uh, Paul has seen the evidence of this in the Gentiles. He speaks in Romans 2.13 verse 16, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So in short, yes, your brother is the law. They know God's laws. And it's important to remember that in both of these scriptures, it's Paul talking about believers. Um, This tax collector... His conscience bore witness. His conflicting thoughts accused him. It's important to note, you know, that even though we are not supposed to, to be judging in general, it's, we should be extremely careful when we're dealing with fellow believers because they have the law written on their hearts. And even though they may not be doing Christianity the way we would do it, uh, their conflicting thoughts accuse them or excuse them. The, if they're meeting with God, we need to be very careful uh, before making our own judgments because it's God that knows our hearts. He is the only one that has all the facts. 
Now in Micah uh, chapter 6, I don't have this verse on my slides. Uh, God is speaking through the prophet as a magistrate. Uh, he even says, you know, uh, hear you mountains, the indictment of the Lord. Uh, but he, he sort of lays out what we're to do here. There's, there's a list. God speaks. Do, do, do I want river, a thousand rivers of oil? No. I want you to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly before your God. So these slanderous and unrighteous judgments, these are pretty clear examples of evil speech, right? Uh, as, as evil speech goes, pretty easy to spot. Um, but there are some examples of evil speech uh, that we may even consider common sense. Now, common sense, it's a slippery, slippery concept, because everybody's definition of common sense is a little bit different. But to illustrate this idea, we're going to look at Peter. In Matthew chapter 16, there's an interesting conversation happening between Jesus and his disciples. Uh, in verses 13 through 20, he asked them, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And apparently, uh, the rumors had been flying because the, uh, the disciples had a bunch of different answers. Well, they say you're one of the old prophets come back. You are his contemporary. You're John the, De you're John the Baptist. Um, but when Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered in verses 16 through 20. He answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my father, which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Can you imagine being Peter at that moment? How incredible that must have been. Um, a new name, a promise of spiritual authority, elevation above his peers, peers who squabbled all the time about who, who was Jesus' favorite and who, who would sit closest to him. How, what a, he, he must have thought, here I have arrived. I'm sure he returned to that moment for the rest of his life. And it's a very good thing he had that because in the very next verse, this happens. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. That shall never happen to you. But he turned to Peter, or he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. The whiplash. The swing there is incredible. Now, we do not know the exact content of Peter's rebuke. Mark's gospel indicates that Peter uh, took him aside. Matthew seems to only hear the gist of the conversation. But this does appear to be rather abrupt, since what Peter is saying seems to be fine. Seems like common sense. If my friend or mentor was claiming that their death would, was imminent, I can see how trying to calm them down would seem like common sense. If my mentor was about to walk into a city where he had deadly enemies with stated goals to kill him, I might try to talk him into not doing that. Uh, and this, this worked for Jesus in the past. This is not the first time this would have happened. Uh, when he was, when he was uh, born, an angel came to Joseph and told Joseph, Herod wants to kill the boy, leave. And they did. They avoided that dangerous situation. It didn't go back until Herod was dead. But listening to Peter's rebuke from Jesus' perspective, I think, sheds a little bit of light on this. If you're Jesus, you know what's coming. You live with the certainty of it. That horrific humiliation, the unimaginable pain, the cruelty that he knows is about to be poured out on him by the people that he lives for and that he intends to die for. 
What holds him together is what happens next. The scripture in 21 says, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and to be killed and on the third day be raised. Jesus leans on this. He has to. He has to know what's coming next. That knowledge, that hope is sustenance. Now Peter says, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you, but this must happen. As horrible as it is for the people God loves to be saved, it's got to happen. So when Peter's trying to comfort his mentor, he probably intends it to come across as, don't worry, Jesus, you're not going to die. We won't let them take you. It'll be fine. But Jesus hears his enemy. It's either discouragement, this will never happen to you. You won't be raised again. This people won't be saved or temptation. This doesn't have to happen. You can stay away from the city. Do hit and run ministry for years without getting caught. All you have to do is abandon the pain. This now, for Peter, in this situation, was evil speech. Without realizing it, he had conveyed an attack on Jesus at a, crit at a critical time in his ministry. So we all walk around with a couple bags of tools, right? We pick up godly wisdom in our walk with God, spending time in the Word, spending time in prayer. But we also pick up tools as we walk through the world. Education, mentors, uh, mistakes made and corrected. You know, we have earthly wisdom uh, that we win through you know, hard experiences or through schooling. And when we heal from a surgery, we thank God, but we also thank the surgeon, right? If you have a friend, I'm telling you this now, who wants to go to a place where powerful people want to kill them, I strongly encourage you to consider telling them not to do that. That's most of the time very good advice. What was different about Peter's case? Anybody? Yeah, God had spoken. God had spoken and Peter didn't listen, didn't believe, or didn't think that it was important. It was time to put down his earthly wisdom because when God speaks, the rules change. A few small fish cannot be cut into a hundred pounds of fish. Jars of water cannot become wine. Trust me, the science does not check out. But when God speaks, all the rules change. When God speaks that water will become wine, it does. Peter is a man, and he's broken out of the box. He has constant trouble with this. Um, like his incident in the Garden of Gethsemane. They came to take Jesus away, and Peter drew his sword and tried to kill a man to defend Jesus. And when armed men with ill intent approach, it is a good time to draw your sword some of, if not most of the time. But when God speaks, we need to have the wisdom to leave it sheathed. Or you'll cut someone's ear off for no reason. Or, heaven forbid, I don't think Peter was aiming for the ear. Uh, we may do worse. By way of application, I think it's pretty unlikely that anyone here is going to be in a sword drawing scenario, while it could happen. Um, but it is likely at some point that someone will share something with you or you'll feel something that causes your earthly wisdom spider sense to tingle. Uh, and when that, you know, wisdom for you in that situation is listening to the tingle and then not speaking right away, not acting right away. If a friend says to you that they feel God may be speaking to them to sell everything they own and give it to the poor, you should think before you talk. Because obviously that's a terrible idea by worldly wisdom, right? But there is scriptural precedent for it. And if God spoke it, then it's not a bad idea. This ties into the second half of our key verse today. That's 411 if you lost track in James. The one who speaks against a brother or judges a brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. A number of years ago, uh, a friend of mine felt from the Lord that he was to sell his business and move far away to minister overseas. Uh, it seemed to be a terrible idea at, a time, at the time. Uh, the business was doing well. He had a very young family. Um, 
you all have heard this story enough times to know. I'm not going to be able to pull a, the rest of the story on you. Um, this is Pastor Rob's story. Uh, and it worked out. You know, he did this. Uh, and moved away. And it, you know, it, uh, it seemed like a terrible idea at the time. But I honestly, I was thinking about it before I came up here. I wouldn't even know how to start to estimate the number of lives that that ministry has touched through through teaching and through ministry over there and back here and how it you know continues to this day 20 some odd years later um, the profit there is is for me uncountable so right up until the moment he sold that business he was running it with a, a combination of godly and earthly wisdom right he learned how to run a business how to start a business you know, education, mistakes made and learned from. And it was, it was going fine um, right up until the moment that God said, it's time to get rid of it. When God spoke, the time for earthly wisdom ended and the time for godly wisdom began. And he could have found any number of people, any number of Christians that would have told him, you're out of your mind. Don't do this. It's a terrible idea. It's wrong by your family. Fortunately, when he took this to his authority, they didn't react instantly. They didn't judge that word of God. They didn't reach for their ear-cutting sword and tell him to stay. They prayed about it first. Now, here is the sad part of this message. I tell this story because I, I don't have one of my own. Uh, like Peter, I reach for my earthly wisdom out of reflex. Um, in fact, there's a trail of metaphorical ears in my wake. Um, probably like Peter, when Jesus is talking, I'm either distracted or I'm busy thinking about what I'm going to say next. Uh, or I'm deciding that when he speaks, there's something else more important that I have to deal with before applying or acting on the word. So I have to say that Peter gives me a lot of hope. Peter is not instantly cured of his impulse to reach for his earthly wisdom by a single rebuke from Jesus. He has to screw up and repent over and over and over again. For years, he's rebuked by Jesus, later by Paul, but he always receives that correction. And it takes a long time for him to learn this lesson, and I'm so glad because it is taking a long time for me. So to close, that's the encouragement that I'll give you. If anything in this set of verses, has pricked your spirit, as almost all of it has mine. Uh, I encourage you. That's good. Maybe you find yourself wrestling with pride. Maybe you realize that what you thought was humility was actually pride wearing a sad mask. Maybe you've caught yourself judging someone or someone's, and even though a big part of you feels rightness in judging them, you've realized that that's not righteousness. Maybe you've discounted a word of God for your life or for someone else's life. Maybe you're a person with influence or charisma and you've realized just how easy it would be to counsel someone out of God's will and that terrifies you. This is a good first step. So the first thing that tax collector did on the day he went to the temple was realize that he needed to go. He needed to realize that he was broken. Then he went out and prayed. He took himself to the judge. He humbled himself and was justified. So that's what we're going to do. Because we can't change or fix ourselves. But Jesus spoke miracles into being. And he's still speaking. As long as we listen. Bless you.